This is the Comics Alternative Euro Comics reviews of I Am Legion and Tyler Cross Blackrock. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Euro Comics. I'm Derek. And I'm Edward. And we're two guys, or one and a half, with PhDs <laughs> who love talking about comics. That's right. Although you're not a half a man, you're just almost there with your PhD. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and on this month's Euro Comic episode, we're going to be looking at two books, both of which are written by Fabien Nuri. We're going to begin with I Am Legion, written by Nuri and with art by John Cassidy. And then after that, we're going to look at Tyler Cross, Black Rock, written by Fabian Nuri and art by Bruno. But before we get into those titles, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Euro Comics is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts can be 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some extra special specials. Sometimes those discounts will be at 45% off of the cover price, sometimes at 50% off cover. But often, you can find discounts that are more impressive than that. That's right. Right now, at Discount Comic Book Service, the graphic novel of I Am Legion, which we'll be discussing today is 30% off for only thirteen ninety seven. Wow. That's a great discount. And you can get other Humanoids books on DCBService.com as well. So whether you like your comics with a more European flavor or otherwise, you can't go wrong by visiting the website of our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service. Go to DCBService.com and they'll take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your books there... Please be sure to send them an email and tell them that Edward and Derek sent you. Absolutely. So, Edward, how are things going with you? Oh, oh, they're they're, they're good. They're good. You know, I'm I'm really glad to be um doing the show. It's really keeping me abreast of a lot of the new re- new release reading here in the U.S. And um, it's good to to be in closer touch or keep better tabs on just how many French books are making it uh, into English these days, and acro- across quite a variety of publishers. Yeah, and it's good that uh, you know you're using the opportunity to, to to do more reading, especially given the fact that you're in the middle of a big move right now. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, moving's never fun for anyone. Well, yeah. So we'll be moving from San Jose to Oregon, Eugene, Oregon. Uh, come next week, I'll be a proud resident of uh, the home of the the Ducks. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so next month, the next time that we do one of these Euro comic series, you will be a duck. Uh, well, uh, if I ever make it to a Ducks game, I'm not much of a football person, but I'll be live from Oregon. So, Okay. Maybe we can introduce you that way. Live from Oregon, it's Edward Govan. <laughs> well, good luck with the move. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So let's go ahead and get into this month's books, and we're going to begin with I Am Legion, uh, written by Fabian Nuri, with art by John Cassidy. This was published in English from Humanoids this past July, although originally, I think uh, the series came out in three albums, what was it, between 2004 and 2007? That's right. That's yeah. right. And, uh, and the three albums were The Dancing Fawn... Vlad and the Three Monkeys, and those are the three sections that we have in this collected edition from Humanoids, I Am Legion. Right. In the English version, this happens a lot, but the English version will often wait for a French series to finish because French series often come out at the rate of one volume a year. So um, that's, 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 too, uh, that, that's a too big a gap to, 
to keep a book in readers' minds for serialization in the U.S., which is more on a monthly basis. So publishers will wait till um, you know an arc is finished or or an entire story, and then release it in a single volume in the U.S. That that happens a lot. Mm-hmm. Now, were any of those three individual albums, The Dancing Fawn, Vlad, and The Three Monkeys, released in English? Not that I, not to my knowledge. No, I believe um, uh, because Humanoids generally doesn't let other people. Uh, do their books, other pu- other English language publishers, they bring them over themselves. And so as far as I know, they're the ones who did, um, uh, they're the ones, they're the only ones who, 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 uh, who brought any of this series over. Because hmm. I remember seeing individual albums on Amazon, but it probably was the French versions that I saw. So I guess this is the first English translation of I Am Legion? Yeah, I believe so. And it is by Justin Kelly, who did a lot of major translations back in the day i don't i've tried to get in touch with him before but i've never been able to because but he he seems like someone who'd know a lot about the tangled history of translating euro comics he translated some of um you know some i believe some of the original moebius titles as well as um uh uh enki balal stuff and so he's he's been around uh, on the scene for quite some time hmm okay now had you read any of I Am Legion in, let's say, in French, uh, before this new Humanoids English translation? No, I was aware of the book, but I'll admit I hadn't. And I was also aware of Nihoya as a, as, a, as a writer. He's one of the more prominent mainstream writers in France. So that's why I thought it would be interesting to, to check him out because um, – or to do an episode on him, because the kind of stuff he, he does is very firmly genre, and it, and it does represent, uh, I think, a side of things we don't always see in, in, in the um, – or we're not as aware of in the in the in when we think of U- Euro comics in the U.S., we might tend to think artier, and and he's a a very very successful contemporary French scribe, you know, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, m- m- someone on the par of like a Jonathan Hicks in the U.S. in the U.S. scene or something. Jonathan like that. Hickman. Hickman, yeah, sorry, yeah. Hickman, yeah, and 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 like um, so I actually have translated another series by him that came out. Last summer and what is by it Fabian Nuri? Yeah, it's called Blood and Sand. A uh, Blood and Gold. No, yeah, Blood and Gold. Blood and Gold, and it's a historical adventure set in World War One. A kind of a, a Lawrence of Arabia type adventure. It was also four volumes, and I, I believe it's available on Amazon or iTunes. Um, but um, and I've read other books by him because uh, around the time he started becoming famous was the time when I was living in France. So, so I I, I would see his books a lot. Uh, but I, I had not actually read this particular series. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and, and we should mention that our decision to pair the first Tyler Cross book with I Am Legion was something that you had recommended. You said, well, why don't we look at a second book by Nuri? And it's like, hey, why not? And, and you explained what Tyler Cross was to me, and I was hooked. Yeah, and, Tyler, and these, are, these are, you know, kind of um – uh, Legion was a fairly early hit for him, and Tyler Cross is a fairly recent, much more recent book. So there, there's about almost a decade between uh, 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 of of writing experience between them, mm. between the two publications. Yeah, well, you know, we're going to be talking about Tyler Cross later in the show. Let's go ahead and jump into I Am Legion, and so this is your first exposure to to I Am Legion, mine as well. Um, h- how did you find the book? Or, or let me be a little more specific. Um, did you find it easy to get into the story? Uh, yeah. No. T- to be honest, I, I do think. Um, yeah, I-, I don't want to venture a speculation as to what the cause might be, but I did find that the book is uh, presents a lot of information. It's fairly. It's 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 fairly well researched and imbricated into the historical events of the time, which happened it would be like World War Two. It's a World War Two book, you know, and it references a lot of actual events um, in a very detailed way. But I did feel like the first book, especially, was was quite difficult to get into because there's a lot of information presented, but in a very oblique manner. Um, uh, again, I'm not exactly sure why it was done the way it was done, but. Uh, I, I do think there's a lot of location jumping. There's location jumping, especially in the middle of pages without sort of um, little boxes to, to tag you as to where you might, might where, where geographically you might be. 
Um, you, you have to, there's a lot of faces presented, a lot of characters, and um, I guess I felt like it was sort of backing into its story, um, and it's already a complicated story with a lot of side character touches. I mean, he does a lot of work with just little details of people's tradecraft, and, and I, I can point to some of those later. But so I, I guess I felt like it, it was very difficult to get your bearings in, and and the first book, The Dancing Fawn, is really really dialogue heavy. And it's not t- until toward the end of that book, and then much more so in the later books, that we get large action scenes. Um, that was my general take, I guess. Yeah, my reaction to the book was very similar to yours, especially in the first third of I Am Legion, the the Dancing Fawn volume. And... Um, I mean, it's a great story, but it's densely packed. And when you said that there's a lot of dialogue in that first section, you weren't kidding. And it, when I first started reading the book, anytime I would put it down for more than, let's say, an hour, I would have to go back the next time I picked it up and reread just to get my bearing straight. Because, again, there's so much information in that first section, especially. There are a lot of characters. There's a lot of history. Uh, you, you know, you'd mentioned that. And we do get historical characters in this in this book. So along with the fictional figures, we also have Wilhelm Canaris, uh, Winston Churchill, Gunther von Klug, um, and, and, of course, Vlad the Impaler, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a very ambitious work. And, you know, it, it strikes me now that you know, I'm trying to describe it. We should mention that, um, you know, this is a bo- something about the premise, I guess, because this is this is a book. It takes place during the Second World War uh, in early 1942. So the, the United States has just entered World War II. Um, and we find out that an officer in the German army, Rudolf Hasig, he's an Obergruppenführer. Say that three times fast. Uh <laughs> He is overseeing some experiments where – and at first we don't know exactly what's going on, but it involves a little girl. Her name is Anna, and they inject her blood into the bodies of others, and through some means she controls them. Um, Remotely, no matter the distance. Exactly, exactly. And so they're seeing what kind of, of weapon this might be. And then as the story evolves, we find out that, you know, Anna is actually being possessed, I guess, by what they call a strigoi, Mm -hmm. uh, which is what Hungarian for devil or vampire. And then as the story progresses, we learn that Vlad and I guess his brother, Radu, are behind this and so they are possessing other bodies and the germans become aware of this they try to tap that power they can't really do so and in the last half of the book things really go sideways uh, especially for the germans yeah well i think one of the confusing things about the book that takes a long time to lay out because he doesn't lay it out he, for whatever reason, he doesn't lay it out clearly, nor does he even lay out the premise clearly. I would say the premise of exactly what it is Anna does is hinted at throughout the first book, but doesn't really become clear till the end of it. right? And so, But the, one of the other complicated things about the book is that there are so many factions. This isn't just a book about the Allied uh, forces trying to find out what what um, the Germans are up to. It, it's within, within the German ranks, there are at least two parties who are politically pitted against each other. Um, uh, uh, and so the Germans are, you know, have internecine struggle, power struggles. And then it seems that seems to be at, to some degree true among the British as well, because our focus here is on the British. It's a British inspector of some sort, a disgraced detective who, who is sicked onto this case uh, um, uh, through, through uh, an especially grisly, grisly murder. And he finds corruption at high levels because, you know, there are people being remotely controlled, and and when they're remotely right, controlled, and Stanley is the, Stanley is the name of the investigator. Yes, absolutely, and and you know the nature of his disgrace is not made clear until um, I think uh, you know late in book two or even book three, um, uh, but uh, it's just it's just hinted at. So there's a lot of like stuff that's hinted at, and it does. On one hand, you, you know that's a tactic that can draw readers in, into a world. Because it makes you feel like you know you're seeing only the tip of the iceberg. But on the other hand, when there's so much of it, I think it's a little, um, you know, it's it's a little hard to get your footing. Uh, um, and yeah, I, I I mean yeah, that's uh, 
the, uh, and and so um, I guess one of the books it reminds me of it because it, it it basically it's 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 a it is a very ambitious large scale, um, speculative history is uh the work of Tim Powers in like books like Declare, where he tr- you know he tries to um meld you know genies with uh uh the br- br- British operations in, in, during during the World Wars, and um. Yeah, it's it, it it it's like I I do think it's extremely uh and or the Cold War, you know, it's it's, it's very well researched. It's just not um right. Well, here becomes the question though, and and I agree with everything you've said in that there's not a lot of groundwork that's laid out for us, you know, directly or indirectly. We have to end up putting those pieces together. So this book, I Am Legion, definitely does require reader participation in ways that let's say other texts may not. But if we look. At let's say uh, uh, another way of going about this. Okay, so so you're Nuri and you're wanting to lay out some uh, enough information to get the story going. If he had explained things in a little more detail, or in other words, if he had been much more direct with the exposition, might that have seemed a little heavy-handed? Yeah, no, it's a possibility. It's a poss- It's it's a, it's a definite possibility. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So and, and you know, of course, we'll never know because you know, I am Legion is the way that I am Legion is, right? And so we can't compare the way it is now with the way it could be. Um, I mean, I I did find it a little, if not difficult, then it took me longer, let's say, to get into the story. But once I was into it, especially by that second third, uh, I, I was into it, uh, and, and then things sped up after that. It, it, it's just a matter of getting my, so to speak, narrative sea legs in that first section. Yeah, I mean, I do think a lot. We said there's a lot of dialogue in the first book, and but but we also said that the first book doesn't seem to lay out information clearly. And I think the uh, so then what is all that dialogue doing? It seems to beg that question. And in in my mind, a lot of that dialogue is doing character work. I mean, he does his his characters do react and respond to each other in complicated ways as though they were used to living with each other. You know, they, they, they are people who he presents them as, uh, uh, in, in such a way, especially Stanley's unit. He has a unit that he's called back together because he's come out of retirement for this or been called out of retirement for this or, or, or out of, you know, it's, it's clear that they all know each other. They've all worked with each other before. They're used to working with each other in certain ways. Um, so, I mean, I do think a lot of the dialogue is devoted to that, and there are nice touches there. It's just that often those nice touches feel like they're just extra things for us to re- keep track of and remember, since they're not direct plot or uh, information advancing touches. Right. And, you know, one of those things that we're asked to, to keep up with uh, and, and to try to you know, separate are the many, many different characters in this book. So, you know, there are a couple that we haven't even mentioned yet, and that is Peter Wilkes and Victor Thorpe. They become central in this narrative. And those are the first two characters that we're introduced to, right, mm-hmm. uh, along with Thorpe's assistant, Nikolai Moldovan. And we see something weird going on between Thorpe and Wilkes in that Wilkes is tied to a chair and he's yelling at Thorpe for some reason. Thorpe is talking relatively calmly with Wilkes. We don't know exactly what's going on. Thorpe slits his arm open. His blood floats up and then something freaky happens. Next thing we know, there's a big fire and we learn eventually that Peter Wilkes is elsewhere. And and we should mention that Wilkes is a British intelligence officer. So who who has contact directly with Winston Churchill? Um, and so we're introduced to these characters, but then there's the team that you had mentioned, you know, Stanley, uh, the woman that he's close with, you know, His that had something to, right, that, that, you know, was partly the result of uh, that, that shaming, I guess, Marjorie. And then another investigator, Lester, there are a couple of others. Uh, yeah. We're introduced to several Germans. And so it's hard to keep the names in place. Um, and then sometimes, I mean, I like John Cassidy's art. But at times, I found it a tad difficult to distinguish one character from another, right. especially without context. Case in point, um, you know, fairly early on, we're introduced to the young girl who is, I guess, possessed, right? Anna, uh, the Strigoi. And later, 
we meet someone, another young woman by the name of Maria, right? She is the daughter of – is he a butcher in town that the character Carell is is uh, staying with? Yeah. And at, right. first, and at first I thought that maybe Maria – was Anna from a different perspective or a different angle. She looked a tad different, but not that different. Mm -hmm. But it took me a while to realize, oh, those are two different characters. And, and I right. think the same thing is going on with a couple of other characters as well. So, for instance, there, there's one figure, a German figure named von Kleist, um, or I guess von Kleist. Right, and, which, com and, to complicate things, that's only an, an alias, right? No, von Kleist, I think, is his real name. Oh, okay. The uh, early, earlier name he gives is an alias, but he looks like, and I can't remember a name, a, his name, another character that we're introduced to in the last half of the book. So, you know, e even getting into that last half, uh, there are a lot of characters to keep track of. There are a lot of names. And so trying to juggle in your head who the main players are and what roles they play is a challenge. Yeah, and, and I know Cassidy's a star, and I do think Cassidy's art is should or is a, a draw for this book for American readers because I'm, um, um, you know, I I think I, on a pers purely personal note, I think um, Cassidy's art has always been a little off putting for me because his people, his people always seem to be to, to everyone he draws seems to live in the uncanny valley for me because of the you know the 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 the, the realism yet also combined with this sort of high key lighting that um flattens out their skin uh, uh and if you, uh, and makes it really shiny and and like it i don't know um so like i i think looking at, at, le at looking at it at length the the um the faces do begin to blur for me and it's very difficult for me to to say how much of that is me as a reader and how much of that is is Cassidy because all the other works by Cassidy like, that I've read like I don't know his run with Joss Whedon on X Men or his or Planetary or Star Wars you know those were all character sets I I, I knew going in mm -hmm. so I didn't there wasn't that much establishing to, or differentiation to do it just it was um, yeah it's it's hard to say but you know thematically I do think the book is, you know is trying to say some some rather large things i mean it, it's it's definitely it's strange to say this but it's it's uh it's a different take on the holocaust and it's a different t and, and 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 i think one of the more it's a, it's it's a it's a fairly disillusioned take on world leaders and and also on the valkyrie operation to uh, mm -hmm. assassinate hitler Right. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned the Holocaust in light of I Am Legion, because in no way did I see this as a Holocaust narrative. Um, I mean, I saw this, and it, it may sound a little off, but when I started reading this, one of the first narratives I uh, immediately thought of was the Dirty Dozen. Hmm. Because there's getting a group of, of people of diverse backgrounds together, and they're going to you know, pull off some kind of operation that takes place in a castle. Okay. Now, I am Legion shifts after that. So, it, I mean, the uh, the hit on the castle against the Nazis is not the be all end all, right? As it is in the Dirty Dozen. But but that's what I was uh, I was thinking of. So, I mean, we're not seeing victims, especially Jewish victims of the Holocaust. What we're seeing are the German army, right? Uh, and of course, the hires up uh, with the SS, uh, because the people that they have now. I don't think it's ever clear, or if it is, I, I was dense and missed it, that the people that they're using for experimentation are Jews. I don't think they ever spelled that out, did they? Well, no, there's a hmm, – I don't want to get into spoilers, but there's a scene where Anna is being put to a test um, um, by – her, 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 by German officers to see h how successfully and how many people she can control at once. Because when she controls right. people, basically they all become her. It's one mass consciousness, hence the name I Am Legion. And mm -hmm. um, um, I think in that one, they pit her, um, they, they fairly explicitly state that she had, uh, that the people, the soldier, the expendable soldiers they give her to control are. Um, camps camp are from camps, and then uh, and then the uh, the people they're pitting them against uh, on the on the mock battlefield are 
convicts. And if the convicts, uh, there, there, there are army officers who've been accused of, uh, I mean, charged with, um, you know, black market profiteering or desertion or some kind of, and if they survive, they'll be sent, they'll be given a chance to survive by being sent to Stalingrad. Whereas, um, the, the, the impressive thing supposedly about the camps or she's manipulating is that they're in pitiful physical condition, but sh- they can still, you know, fight effectively because she's controlling them. And, and that way it's, it's the, the idea is that, oh, these camp people, we, we've been just exterminating them, but we can recycle them. Okay. See, I mean, that makes sense to me, but I don't remember that being pointed out that they were specifically Jewish because, you know, there were more people in the concentration camp besides Jews. Sure, sure, sure. And, and you know, I mean, my, again, my money would probably be on the fact that, you know, they're Jews here, although they don't spell it out. And so because they're not – because Nuri is not explicit about that, that's why I'm a little iffy calling this book or associating it as a, as a Holocaust narrative in some way. Well, I mean, I think it was that scene and the other idea that the reason the inter- – the, one of the reasons for this internecine German squabble, power power struggle, is that some of the Germans, in addition to wanting to kill Hitler, also think that this is – that this that this up that this recycling of camp survivors is um uh it, it, it is not in line with the ideals of purity of blood purity and and right. for a book that revolves around blood it's her it's getting her blood it's getting the blood of Vlad or Radu that allows them to control even so much as a you know a drop of their blood swallowing it or having it injected or you know sometimes it just kind of seems to fly through the air and spear into people but yeah. it's blood that that uh is at the court so then that yeah i guess those were yeah the the blood of the purity thing that definitely came out and you know now that i'm thinking about it um you you were talking about the competing factions in in Germany. Now we do have the historical character of Wilhelm Canaris, and he you know an admiral was an admiral and head of the Abwehr, which is the German intelligence agency. And he, if I remember correctly, does mention in some way, or at least someone does, that it's unfortunate. It's, I'm paraphrasing. It's unfortunate that Hitler should you know you know, do this final solution thing because it, it detracts us from, you know, winning the war and what we should be doing. In other words, uh, you know, part of, you know, Project Valkyrie was to to bring German victory or at least dignity back from the darker edges where Hitler had been taking it, which, which, which sounds kind of strange, but... Um, but I think that this was hinted at there as well. And again, it's part of this really thick historical backdrop that Nuri is, is writing within. And no, and the point that you just brought up is pivotal, I think, to the climactic scene with Churchill. I mean, uh, the the I um that what what we can and can't forgive the Germans, what we have to pay attention to or not. Right. Um. His, his Good story. point. So. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, you, as you mentioned, uh, you know Churchill is one of these historical figures who appears two or three times in this book. Um, so yeah, this is this is it, it's a strange bird in that it's hard for me to pit this or to put this, I guess, into to one particular genre. It is a war story. It is a horror story. It is a historical work uh, work of historical fiction. Uh, it, it, it's all of these things. Yeah, absolutely, and, and of course, definitely a vampire narrative. Yeah, and it's an alter, it's an alternate history. You know, it's a speculative history. Yes, well. yeah. So you know, we've used the word ambitious for this a few times, and and you know, I, I think it's apt. Yeah, and and Nuri does draw on history a lot, um, mostly twentieth century history for his, um, uh, uh, for 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 a lot of different projects. You know, um, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, and you know, the war period. I would say. The World War II period is a fertile I, – I think because of the relative lack of translation, we're not quite aware of how fertile the World War II period is both for French fiction – prose fiction writers and for French comic books. And, uh, I mean the occupation and the collaboration, all these were – you know, ver- these are very, very – this that history is still very close. It's it's alive mm-hmm. and well, and and people are still dealing with it in many ways. Yeah. 
Now, let me, let me ask you, are you familiar with Nuri's Chronicles of Legion? No, no, no. I, I, all I know is that he's, he switched publishers for it, but, uh, but I don't, I'm not. Because that's a series of books. I think it's published uh, by Titan. Oh, um, oh, terrific. And, and I have not read any of those, but I have seen those listed, let's say, on, like, on Amazon. Um, so I, I'm assuming that this has some connection to this book that we're discussing today, I Am Legion, maybe oh. just picking up where it leaves off, or maybe it's a prequel. I don't know. Yeah. No, it was, it, was a, it was a series begun after the success of Legion, but with a different French publisher, no longer Humanoids. And it was a series of different artists. Okay. Um, now, do you know who that French publisher was? Oh, it was Glenat. Uh, the people okay. who did uh, Blood and Gold, the, the, the Nuri book that I translated last summer. Okay. Um, but I guess that, uh, you know, the British publisher Titan uh, has the English translation of those. Well, it would be interesting to check out. I should ask Titan about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, we've mentioned some of our issues getting into the story, but overall, I, I enjoyed I Am Legion. Yeah, I do think it was um uh it, it it was a worthwhile read um especially if any of the genres uh like horror, speculative history um are are, are appeal to you. I do think it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a good piece of work for that. Um Mhm. Well, let's transition to our other book, also by Nuri, and this is Tyler Cross, Black Rock, and the art on this book is by Bruno, and this is published digitally as an English translation by Europe Comics, uh, and I think this came out, what, October of last year, digitally, but the title was originally published in 2013 by the French publisher Dagard, right? Uh, Dago, yeah. Or Dargo, that's how you pronounce it, Dargo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, now this is a series. Uh, there's Tyler Cross, Black Rock, and then last year in, in French, I think another volume, the second volume came out, Tyler Cross, Angola. That's right, and they're both available in English right now. Uh, um, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, the Europe Comic site does its pricing in euros for some reason, but they have links to... All the other sites where they're available, like Amazon, Comixology, Google Play, iBooks, Kobo. So again, this is dig only available digitally in English. But you know, it's a hundred, it's a hundred-page graphic novel, and it's available for three bucks on Comixology. It's totally worth it. I, I mean, it's uh, the the new Tyler Cross, the second volume, Angola, is is currently priced at twelve bucks or eleven ninety nine. But for two ninety eight, you really can't go wrong for uh, Tyler Cross Volume One, Black Rock. Um, uh, at at Comicsology, um, and also people can check out the Euro Comics website. It's EuropeComics dot com. Yep, EuropeComics dot com. It's an initiative primarily of MediaTune, which is the umbrella company for uh, three major Franco-Belgian comics publishers of long standing. That would be Dargo, Le Lombard, and um, Dupuy. And there's this is together. They're one of the the the, the huge They'd be one of the big three in France, um, commercial in the mainstream commercial comics, uh, um, you know, equivalent to a, a DC or a Marvel in terms of um, their share, their market share, and and um, the the amount, the number of comics they put out. Okay, so so this is, I guess, uh, another digital initiative. Uh, I guess, in addition to the one that we discussed a couple of months ago, Delcor. Yeah, Delcor partnered with Comixology. Um, uh, Delcor is another one of the big three. The three big three would be gl big commercial three in in France and Belgium would be MediaTune, uh, Delcor, and and um, Glena. But um, and, uh, but uh, yeah, Delcor pa uh, partnered with Comixology. MediaTune mounted their own thing, which is Europe Comics but is available through Comixology and, and other American out, uh, English outlets, as I said, Amazon, iTunes, Kobo, you know, um, uh, yeah. And I think Glena is the only one that has fewer comics available now. Um, they decided to 
release them themselves directly through iTunes and Amazon, but they don't have like a, a centralized site. Mm. Now, we were talking about genre within the context of I Am Legion and Tyler Cross. It's not so much genre blending as we got in the Humanoids book. I mean, this is straight out crime noir. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I felt – well, here's the thing about Tyler Cross is I fell in love with it um, more than a couple of years ago because it was actually serialized in a sadly now defunct uh, French – comics uh review there's a, a review that was founded by a bunch of french creators they got together they were kind of alternate and mainstream creators and they said we want to found a digital only comics review we're going to call it professor cyclops and it went on for almost uh, two years and um one of the first things they serialized was tyler cross but it was in black and white now the only available versions now are in color but uh are colorized but it was this it was this black and white noir and I thought it was just fantastic. It was like Dashiell Hammett's Continental Op went went to Texas to Jim Thompson country, you know, and just screwed up a town, Red Harvest style. I I I I was really blown away by it. Um, so uh, yeah, and, you know, and Bruno is also a really distinctive artist. I mean, his his art is is uh, it's kind of this. It's weird and chunky, um, but it, I, I always really dug it. Like he's, uh, I think I, there's a lot of books by him I, I, I really enjoy. He has this one called Lorna that's like kind of a, an homage to um, 50s B drive in movies, you know, an Attack of the 50 Foot Woman and The Fly, and, you know, and also kind of mixed with porn. It's just, it's just a really wacky, imaginative thing. It's mostly silent, in fact. It's not yeah. available in English that I know of, but. but. Yeah. yeah, we were talking about the the realistic art of Cassidy. I mean, this is very different from that, right? This is, uh, I guess, quite a bit more cartoony, um, mm. if uh, if that makes sense. I I, I don't want to call it too cart or cartoony because it, it's not cartoon in the cute sense, right? Uh, in fact, there's a lot of sexiness and luridness and violence uh, yeah. in not only the story but also in Bruno's art as well. No, it's heavily stylized, and I mean, I'm not against the colors either. I do think the colors give it a more kind of, um, uh, it's it's like uh, the colors give it a uh, an almost mod look. Uh, oddly enough, like uh, you know, I feel like they're this they're they're a heightened garish, uh, as you say, lurid um, color scheme. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and. Um you know, there's a lot of luridness in in this book, Black uh, Tyler Cross, Black Rock. Uh, so basically, this is the story of Tyler. Um, I guess when we first see him, he is seeing a gangster by the name of Giuseppe Di Pietro, and uh, Di Pietro has a job for him. He he goes down into the Southwest uh, in Texas. To to do the job, things take a turn uh, for the worse, uh, kind of unexpected. It involves drugs. And so he finds himself um, kind of trapped in this small town called Black Rock. And Black Rock is owned and run by the Prague family. Uh, so the father, Spencer Prague, is behind everything. Uh, his son, uh, William is the mayor. Uh, another son, Lionel, runs the bank, the only bank in Black Rock. And then a third son, Spencer, is, or Randy, is the sheriff. So, you know, the Prague family owns Black Rock. And Tyler, not long after getting to Black Rock, uh, comes across a woman by the name of Stella Bidwell. And Stella is just about to marry the mayor, William Prague. And we see in the hours or day or so leading up to her marriage just what kind of family the Progs are, especially the father. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's an obvious homage to the John Sturgis movie with Spencer Tracy here, right? Bad Day at Black Rock. Mm -hmm. um, though, though, uh, though the, the plot is very different. And, and again, this is that's just the beginning of the plot. I think there's a lot of reversals and and twists and like i would say this is a fairly complicated book in terms of just sheer events as well and yet it compared to legion it it's clear as a whistle because clear as a you know bell or you know 
because partly because you're following Tyler's character constantly, so you really only have the the one POV. Um, I mean, you do see, uh, uh, you you see some other events, but like it, it's it's a lot. It, it's an, I I don't despite the the sheer number of crisscrosses and double crosses and relationships in in, in, in Tyler Cross, I I don't think I ever felt confused because you know it's. Yeah, it's just presented in a more straightforward way. Oh yeah, and you're right. There, uh, especially as the the story continues, there's uh, there are a lot of twists and turns. Uh, you know, one of the big complications uh, takes place because of Stella's father, Joe Bidwell, and he becomes a much more prominent character halfway through the book. And then what he does sends the narrative in a whole different uh, trajectory. Uh, and then there's this third act, uh, which takes place on a train. So, I mean, there's a lot going on in this story. And I, I, I think you're right in that one of the things that keeps this relatively focused and contained is that for the most part, we're, we're following – uh, you know Tyler Cross, right? I mean, even if we don't have his point of view, um, we're following his actions, and there's not this kind of cross cutting that we see in I Am Legion, right? Between one person's story and then another person's story halfway around, around the world, and then a third person's story in a completely different part of the globe, so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, here it's it's fairly focused. Now, you know, we've mentioned point of view. One of the things I thought was quite curious about this Tyler Cross book was the shift that we had. Um, this is uh, maybe a little before halfway through. This is when Tyler is in jail. In jail. Oh, yeah. Well, and, that's, this, and is the Stella, moment, this is the right, moment that it, sold me on the book. No, go ahead. Describe it. But this is the moment. No, it, actually. So Stella, Stella is, is you know getting married at this very moment. Tyler is in jail. And we get a perspective from a rattlesnake. And I think that's a rattler, isn't it? Yeah, it's a pet, a pet, a pet rattler. Yeah. A, yeah. And the rattler is in its own cage looking at Tyler Cross, who is in jail, his cage. And there's something about Tyler that the snake, that the rattler is drawn to. And so the, the rattler can see the character and in many ways kind of a kindred spirit. So he comes to respect Tyler Cross. And so we have several pages. And of course, there's a jailbreak at this point as well. But it's, it's not only seen through the eyes of the rattlesnake, but it's narrated by the rattler. Yeah. Like which that, is weird. That that was actually the moment because it sounds so over the top, and yet that moment really sold me on the book when I first read it, and and especially when they unite the 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 rattlesnake's narration with you know the reflection. You see part of the action as a reflection in the rattlesnake's eye in a close up, and it's like yeah, that just that really just because it, it see it, it was it, it is it's totally weird, and uh, yeah, for some reason that was that was the thing that really um, made me like it in uh. That that sort of eccentricity, or or uh, I mean, in the in the French, uh, like um, the rattlesnake is named Cherry, like C H E R I, mm -hmm. which usually gets translated as honey or darling. But like I think those sounded too feminine, so they called this translator called him Buddy. And um, I do think it, it is the masculine version of it, so Buddy is okay. Maybe I'm not sure. I have another alternative right now. I think, but there's something nice about it being like. Uh, you know, the rattlesnake has a pet name and a very, a very affectionate pet name. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah. So yeah, I really lo I like that. Yeah, and you know, I, I guess just describing it on its own, outside of the context of Tyler Cross, it does sound a little over the top. But you know, one of the reasons why I think we momentarily see the action and he hear the narration through the rattlesnake is because Nuri is setting up, you know, well, Nuri and, and Bruno are, are setting up this connection here in terms of character type between the Rattler and Tyler Cross, because Tyler Cross is very much like this Rattlesnake. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's anti-hero all the way. He's not, um, yeah. Yeah. He's a survivor. Uh, he is very observant. He's keen. He's he's ruthless when he needs to be, and his bite is deadly, so to speak. Yeah, it's a bit like Dieter Lumpen, you know, um, when we uh, we did that, but with the more contemporary edge, I think. Yeah, although the difference between uh, Tyler Cross and Dieter Lumpen is Dieter Lumpen 
was an unlikely hero, right? So he didn't get things right all the time. And in fact, many times he didn't seem to be on top of his game. He just kind of stumbled into things. Mm. Whereas I get the sense that Tyler Cross, because I haven't read the second volume, Angola, but I get the sense that, you know, Tyler Cross is rarely off. I mean, he was momentarily off in this book in that he got thrown in jail. He was caught unaware. Uh, but that doesn't happen often. And you know, when you cross Tyler Cross, so to speak, <laughs> um, you're in trouble. Yeah, no, that that's definitely true. Yeah, and he's not sentimental at all. I mean, you know, we do have, as we have in a lot of classic noir narrative, uh, you know, the femme fatale. So, so Stella plays that character, to, you know, to, to a large degree. Uh, and then there is uh, later on, and I don't think this is any kind of spoiler because you expect it from the genre, um, you know, this, uh, you know, coming together between, you know, the, the main hero, this anti-hero Tyler Cross, and then the femme fatale Stella. Um, and... Cross realizes at the end that there's no way that they could stay together, even though Stella, you know, that's something that that she would like. Um, so, I mean, this this um, I guess plays along the lines of classic noir narrative, you know, film or novel. Um, so, it 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 is a I guess kind of a clearer focus in terms of what it's attempting to do. Although this story does take some unexpected turns throughout. Yeah, no, I, 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 I yeah, I, I do think there, there's a, a little bit of a narrative breather or a lull when he and Stella first uh, managed to get out of town, and um, I, I, I think the, the the story takes a little detour to focus on their relationship, as you say, and and uh, why it is they, uh, you know, are both attracted to each other, attracted to each other, and why it won't it won't work, and um. Uh, like I, I think, I think, you know, um, when I first read it, I was like, "Oh, this story is nearing its end," but that's really only like you know maybe the three quarters point. There's still some 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 major uh, uh, set pieces to come. You're uh, talking about where they're holed up in the hotel. Yeah, exactly. In this town. Yeah, and and one of the reasons why I think this scene is here is to for for a couple of reasons. One, to play out the relationship or to flesh out, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> even literally, uh, the relationship between Stella and Tyler. Uh, but it also shows her unstable nature because she at one point is doing something with the drugs that Tyler uh, recovers. And it just seems really strange. And then soon after that, she seduces him in bed. And so it, it it's like she's running hot, she's running cold. And, and again, it kind of fits within the femme fatale character type right sure. uh in, in in some ways uh in, in that she's unpredictable in that she's a you know uh another metaphor she's a live wire you know you don't want to get too close to her yeah and so i i think that's another reason why that scene was there because we got to see those sides of her yeah no that that's yeah i think that's that's a, a very uh, astute read yeah. And then, of course, uh, you know, and again, this is a very masculine reading uh, way of reading this, but it's only after he beds her. Right. Uh, he makes love to her that she seems to calm down. And so, again, you know, this is, you know, the, uh, the this antihero who who attempts to tame uh, the female. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, you know, to be fair, Stella This is not a good. Uh, this is not a book where women are treated especially well. Um, well, no, but yeah, given yeah. the genre, would you right. expect it? No, no, surely, surely, no. But like, but like Stella, Stella goes through. Stella's in quite a bad situation, even when we find her uh, first meet her. I mean, you know, I mean, she's she's engaged to marry. Uh, yeah, uh, William. Yeah, a real, Prague, a, real yeah. a real, a real prick. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's, and he's he's already. She, she's 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 in a bad situation already that that uh, that is rather openly depicted yeah right yeah and, and it's nasty and not only is she being mistreated by her future husband but uh and her know, father by her his, yeah his father well, Sorry. Well, her, yeah uh, by her future father-in-law yeah. uh and uh i mean he pisses on her literally mm. You know, so uh, I mean, she's definitely not in a good situation. But but you know, there's the part in Tyler Cross Black Rock where we do get 
some backstory about Stella's father, Joe. Yeah. And what that does is it not only humanizes and, 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 and sets up the motivations of Joe and what he does, because when we're first introduced to him, when Tyler comes to, you know, to town, uh, he comes across Joe and Joe lets him have some water and then charges him for it. Right. right. And so he seems like a little skin flint, a uh, little off old guy. Right. Uh, but then we get uh, over halfway through the book. Or maybe halfway through the book, some backstory as to who is Joe Bidwell and then Stella. And so we get to see how Stella grew up, uh, how she lost her mother. And, you know, we start feeling for her in ways that we didn't before. And same thing with her father, Joe. No, absolutely. Especially the contrast between, you know, how he came back from the war and how Pro- Prague Sr. came back from the war. I know, on, so. Yeah, and and we do learn in this momentary um, flashback or exposition, I guess, of, of Joe Bidwell's past, uh, that there is an ongoing, not really a rivalry, but a, um, some tension between the Bidwell family and the Prague family. And this tension plays itself out toward the end of, let's say, the second third of this book in ways that we won't give away, but uh, it, it is mighty dramatic. Yeah. I'm yeah, I, I guess that was why I, I, I uh, um, yeah, the sort of town with secrets, it's a staple of noir, but, but it, and, and tech, this part of South and West Texas seems to be, you know, um, Jim, Jim Thompson's territory, but, uh, uh, but but also like the guy the stranger who comes to town and tears the town apart you know that's mm-hmm. uh and who knows exactly what seems to know exactly what to do that that that's like the you know the the red harvest schematic there so yeah i uh, I, and and i think i mean the the french noir is a weird genre in that like i think the there's long been a mm, a fairly Productive cross Atlant- transatlantic, uh, uh, you know, cross pollination, um, but be- uh, between the French and the Americans, and like, you know, the French kept a lot of classic American noir novelists in print over there, even when they went out of print here, and and then those turned up to be, you know, art house inspirations for art house new new wave movies, you know, and and so like. There, and so the French definitely owe a debt of style to noir as it was established by classic Hollywood, but they've they've returned the favor a, a, a lot often as well by by um, just really digging their fingers into this um, um, American genre. Um, and I think this is a good example of how they can how well they can do it. Mm. So now I really want to go and read the second volume of Tyler Cross, Angola. Have you read that? No, I haven't read Angola. I, I definitely want to check that out, and I want to check out another collaboration with Nuri that uh, Bruno did, which is Atar Gull, which is, a, 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 I think, a slave narrative um, from the 1800s, a, a, adapted from a novel from the 1800s by hmm. Eugène Sué. Hmm. Now, um, do you have any sense of how many Tyler Cross stories they're planning, or do they just do them as they do them? To be truth, uh, truthful, um, I believe the first Tyler Cross was just planned as a one shot, and it was because it was successful that they did another one. So hmm. I, I think they're they're all just going to you know do them when they do them. Okay, yeah. so if Angola has proven over the past year, I guess, to be successful enough, maybe a third volume of Tyler Cross is in the works now. Yeah, and that would be that would be terrific. Yeah, since I mean, the last column, the last Cross just came out last year in France, 2015. So, hmm. but it is available in English now. So, yeah. Well, Edward, we started off this month's episode by looking at I Am Legion, written by Fabian Nuri, with art by John Cassidy, and that was a humanoids book. Uh, But then after that, we looked at another Nuri narrative, Tyler Cross, Black Rock, illustrated by Bruno, and published in English digitally by Europe Comics. Yep. So a lot of good Nuri goodness. Yeah, for fans of... Multiple genres. 
Yes, that's right. And if uh, you're intrigued by the discussion that Edward and I have had about the work of Fabian Nuri, John Cassidy, and Bruno, then with I Am Legion, you can get great, great discounts on that by visiting the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. So be sure to go to dcbservice.com, and you're going to find I Am Legion at 30% off of the cover price. But if you search around, you can find 30% off of uh, many, many other Humanoids books. It's a great way for you to get caught up on your European comics readings. And after you do get your books there, get in touch with us and let us know what you think about our Euro comic series. If you go to the website comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message from the comfort of your own computing device via SpeakPipe, which is really easy to use. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way. Our phone number is 4153-COMICS. That's 4153266427. Or feel free to drop us an email at twoguys at comicsalternative.com or write me directly at edward at comicsalternative.com. We'd really love to hear from you. That's right. And you can contact me directly at Derek at ComicsAlternative.com. You can find us all over social media such as Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, and on iHeartRadio. And if you're an Android user, on Google Play Music. But you can still find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and the comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. So there are a lot of ways for people to get in touch with us. And we do like hearing from you. Yes, please write in with thoughts, suggestions, uh, recommendations for things we should cover. We'd love to hear all of it. That's right. Uh, We'll be back next month with more Euro comic goodness. Until then, I'm Derek. I'm Edward. See you next time. Goodbye.